Uh, well, that's the kind of introduction you can't read after. So, um, I want to thank my good friend Julia Kasdorf, who is um, a wonderful poet in her own right, and Robin Becker as well. I'm so grateful to be here with you too. All of you, um, Lauren, thank you. Where are you? Yeah, you're right in front of me for setting all of this up. So, I have a bit of a cold. Sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water to begin with. All right, I'm going to begin with a poem by somebody else. Ode to the Maggot. Brother of the blowfly and godhead, you work magic over battlefields, in slabs of bad pork and flop houses. Yes, you go to the root of all things. You are sound and mathematical. Jesus Christ, you're merciless with the truth. Ontological and lustrous, you cast spells over beggars and kings behind the stone door of Caesar's tomb, or split trench in a field of ragweed. No creed or decree can outlaw you as you take every living thing apart. Little master of earth, no one gets to heaven without going through you first. Yusef Kumanyaka, and uh, it is a dare for a poet to read someone else's work that you love before your own, I think. <laughs> But um, I've always loved poetry for its orality, and I was asked that question today, and I was thinking about the best answer to it I can give you is memorize a poem. Um, I love doing that myself, um, and I think they're meant to be heard, and that one is a great one. So I'm going to just jump around quite a bit. Um, Julia's introduction really was um, pretty incredible and will save me a lot of time in having to provide a backstory. Thank you, Julia. Um, but I will also just add a few things, um, which is the first poem I'm going to read, it's almost always the first poem I read, is a poem I wrote probably close to 20 years ago. It's about a figure from the Odyssey who may need a bit of a gloss. Her name is Calypso. Calypso is a figure who I choose to see as a mermaid, and we can have a discussion about that afterward. Um, but she basically is one of the many women that Odysseus has an affair with while his wife Penelope is back home, you know, unweaving, weaving that whole um, shtick. And she's waiting for him, and he's basically screwing his way around the Aegean. So. When I was about 20, this, this narrative uh, did not quite ring true for me for one particular detail. Every single one of these women, if you remember the Odyssey, is holding Odysseus against his will. Right? Exactly. So all these gorgeous women, and they're making him sleep with him. So I decided that Calypso needed to have her say, and this is Calypso getting her chance to tell her side of the story. She's Jamaican, uh, why not? Caribbean, Aegean, you know, same thing. And uh, an archipelago is an archipelago. And um, I also thought I would invoke the play on the word Calypso. Um, does anybody know where Calypso music originates? Trinidad. Yes, we have an ethnomusicologist in the house. Trinidad, exactly, which is where actually my maternal grandmother is from. So I was glad to work that in. Calypso. These days, I don't even bother combing out my locks. It's dread I gone dread now. Me not stay like them other ones, me love. When mirror and comb, sunning themselves upon every rock. Looking man up and down the north coast. Tourist season, them catch up themselves whole time in the grill. Waiting for some fool full American with belly white like fish. Forget the rum in I'm system and jump in. But Lord, you should see the grin. Man can strip it bad, no? I done learned the lesson long ago when I was young and craving. Keep one great boy called Odysseus in a cave. 
seven years in crooning in my ear. And in wife no same face. The two of we was a sight for envy. I thought I was going to die in constant spring. At last, till the day I'm come to me, as all men finally do. Saying, I'm tired of play. Start talking, pick me and home and wife who can cook and clean. <laughs> well, <laughs> you don't know how I stay, my ready, my love. I did pack up in bag and send him back to that other woman. Same time. <laughs> I hear from Mildred down the way that the gal did take him back too. Him tell her is farce. I did farce him for stay. And she believed the fool. <laughs> but Lord, woman, can also blind when she please. My friend, I tell you, I is too old for all this bangaram. I hear over Trini Way, young man is beating steel drum, making sweet rhyme, and calling music by my name. Well, that the only romance I go and give the time of day. <laughs> so, I'm so glad you laughed. <laughs> Poetry readings are too dour. And here I go making it so. Um, I'm going to read some of the poems from This Strange Land, then I'll read a few new poems, um, just to keep myself honest. But um, the only thing I would add to what Julia said, because that was so helpful, <laughs> um, two days after we moved to the States, my dad died. And um, he had stayed in Jamaica when I was 20. I found out he had committed suicide. So that's another thread that I worked into these poems that becomes apparent if you read the whole book, but not so apparent if you, if you don't. So I'm going to read some of the poems from This Strange Land, which open and tell that story in particular. They're from the section of the book called Dear History. And um, they alternate in three voices. One is the voice of the child looking back. Those are all called Dear History. One is in the voice of a figure that I call Miss Sally, and um, that's a figure loosely based on my grandmother. I say loosely because my grandmother reads these poems and she says, I never said these things, so <laughs> they're in the spirit of what she might say, shall we say. Um, and those are all in her voice. And then there's a third voice, and these are differently titled poems that are a sort of poet looking at this personal and um, public history, okay? Um, I think that's enough information, so I'll just read a few of those. Psalm for Kingston. It begins with the epigraph from the very famous um, Hebrew song, Psalm 137. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem. City of Jack Mandora, me no choose none. Of a Nancy prevailing over mongoose, brother rat, puss, and dog. A Nancy, saved by his wits in the midst of chaos and against all odds. Of body big boy stories told by peacock strutting boys, hush hush, but loud enough to be heard by anyone passing by the yard. City of market women at halfway tree, with baskets atop their heads or planted in front of their laps. Squatting or standing with arms akimbo, susuing with one another, clucking their tongues, calling in voices of pure sugar. Come to do, see the pretty bag I have for you. Then kissing their teeth when you saunter off. City of school children in uniforms playing dandy shandy and brown girl in the ring, tra la 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 la, eating bun and cheese and bulla and mangoes juice sticky and running down their chins, bodies arced in laughter, mouths agape, heads thrown back. City of old men with roomy eyes, crouched in doorways on verandas, paring knives in hand, carving wood pipes or peeling sugar cane. Of younger men pushing carts of roasted peanuts and oranges, calling out as they walk the streets and night draws near of coconut vendors with machetes in hand. City, where power cuts left everyone in sudden dark, where the kerosene lamp's blue flame wavered 
on kitchen walls, where empty bellies could not be filled, where no eggs, no milk, no beef today, echoed in shanty towns, around corners, down alleyways. City where Marley sang, Ja would never give the power to a bald head, while the bald heads reigned. Where my parents chanted down Babylon, Faya, Bon, Ja, Rastafari, Selassie, where they paid weekly Jews, saving for our passages back to Africa. While in their beds, my grandparents slept fitfully, dreaming of America. City that lives under a long memoried sun, where the gunmen of my childhood are today's dons, ruling neighborhoods as fiefdoms. Where violence and beauty still lie down together. City of my birth, if I forget thee, who will I be? Singing the Lord's song in this strange land. Dear History, believe me when I tell you, I did not know her name, but remember the color of her dress, red like my own school uniform. I did not know death could come to a girl, walking home, stick in hand, tracing circles in the dirt, singing as she went along. I did not know death would find someone for wearing the wrong color smock in the wrong part of town. My parents spoke in hushed tones, but I heard the story of her body, dragged from street to gully, left sullied in semen and blood. I heard the song she sang, the one I wish I could sing now. Truth is, I was that girl. Truth is, I was never there. Miss Sally on politics. He's a one-eyed man in a blind eye country, but home can do better when no one want to see what's going on. Every time party man come round, him jumping up and down, Little puppy, eager for please. Him tell me, is not woman business, this election. Is not for me, for understand. Me tell you, all the same, what I know. If you see jackass, don't you must ride it. <laughs> I worked on this book for a long, long time. And so I would read some of the poems aloud at readings, like I'm going to some new poems now, in a few minutes. And what I found really interesting was that poem was a lot more fun to read when George Bush was in president, uh, in the White House. Not that his presidency was more fun, just that that poem was more fun. Um, I'll read a couple more from this section, and then I'm going to turn to a different thread. The Waves. I've always loved Virginia Woolf's novel. This poem has nothing to do with the novel, but I just was so pleased that it shares the title um, of my favorite Virginia Woolf novel, The Waves. We walk into rooms that wait for us to enter them. We walk into waves that threaten to drown us, but they don't. They fill us instead with salt, sand, and their own light. As a child from a small boat, I watched my father swim away, ignoring my mother's pleas, her voice sucked into the wind, my own no match for the undertow or sharks I feared. There are moments in a life when everything comes apart, is ripped so clean who you are is laid bare. My father returned to us 
that day. But he was not the same man I had seen enter those waves. Miss Sally on Love. In my time, I was a girl who liked to spree. The whole world would open for me. If I shift my hips to strain, the fabric of my skirt, just so. Still, I did learn my lesson where love concern. If snake bite you, when you see even lizard crawling with a belly pon grown, you run. Now the gal come to me, says she fall in love with a man who have a plan for change. But she no notice him also carry gun. And Lord, how should I see? Who running the show and who keeping house same way? That is unfortunately a history of many revolutionary movements where women are concerned. So Rastafarianism was no different. Um, to switch to a very different vein, because I'm trying to read some poems too that Julia helped me select that we thought would be resonant for the students who read the first book. Um, I'm equally interested in myth, uh, as much as I'm interested in history, both personal and public. Myth is one of my obsessions, and I loved the question you asked. I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time now. What is it about autobiography that I think necessitates it always being told through some mytho mythological story? That's a great question. Um, but um, I think I also have always loved best three things, and I answered this today when I was explaining why I think I became a poet. Um, song, story, and metaphor. So myth offers me all of those components. This is a story of the mermaid, because I cannot get her out of my head. There's a place where the river meets the sea, where the water turns green and cold and still. A mirror in which you can see into your own eyes, but nothing beneath. In Port Antonio, the children walk behind their mother, peep, peep, cluck, cluck. The crew descends from the house down the hill, down the winding path scattered with rocks. One of the children recognizes the man who sold them bammy and fish last night for dinner and almost turns to wave, but the mother is getting farther ahead. At the dock, sure-footed, she leads the way. The children follow, stepping as if nearing the edge of a cliff. Stopping on the last wooden slat, the mother lifts her dress over her head in one swift motion. At first, the children watch in silence, then begin their protests. No, mummy, please don't go. Their voices seem to arrive from a great distance. She looks out to the island across the way, decides she will swim to it and come right back. Through the shade of trees, patches of sunlight turn her naked body into an underwater scene. The children, howling, clench eyes shut. Only the trees witness what happens next. Only they see the mother's perfect dive into the waiting depths, the sliver of water opening to take her back. My mother as Persephone, because I cannot get the story of Demeter and uh, Persephone out of my head, it wasn't enough that I wrote a poem, which I know some of you have read in the voice of Persephone, um, but I decided then I had to write one again, about an older Persephone. Uh, maybe I'll actually read that one too. That way you can have a counterpoint to hear them. Um, one written when I was in my 20s, the other written when I was close to 40, which I am now, to give you some perspective on what I think happens to us when we treat the same subjects over and over and over again. I don't have a choice, so um, I better figure out a way to do it, is my thinking. 
So I, I really only have a very small number of things I ever care to write about. I care to read about many things, mind you, but as a writer, I'm fairly limited, apparently. So let me get to the poem first, because I didn't plan to read it. It's called Persephone Sets the Record Straight. It might be the better of the two. I, I don't really know. They're just different. Um, this one has more tonal range. They're both in the voice of Persephone. You are all the rage these days, mother. Everywhere I turn, I hear Demeter in mourning, Demeter grieving, poor Demeter. Always craving the spotlight, I know this is what you wanted. Your face on the front page of all the papers. Gossip columns filled with juicy tidbits on what life was like before winter. Old hags in the grocery store whispering how she's let the flowers go, while young women hover in their gardens, fearing their hibiscus will be next on your hit list. After all these summers, you still won't come clean. Passing me iced tea, instead you ask, how's the redecorating? Are you expanding to make room for little ones? Fanning the flies, you avoid my eyes, saying, I so long to be a grandma, you know. For God's sake, mother, can't you tell me the truth now it's done? Just once tell me how you put me in that field, knowing he'd come that you made snow fall everywhere to cover your tracks, that the leaves die still because you can't punish him for confirming your suspicions. Not wanting you, he took me instead. Of course, I ate those seeds. Who wouldn't exchange one hell for another? Much darker poem than I had anticipated writing when I set out to write it, by the way. <laughs> <coughs> That's <coughs> the nature of voice and the persona poem I always love. <coughs> it's a dramatic performance. And so you get to do and say parts of yourself that you would never otherwise reveal. Now this is some kind of double assembly. I don't even know what I was doing. I decided to write all these poems as my mother as the characters. <laughs> so this is called My Mother as Persephone. It wasn't enough to have one layer, apparently. I needed two. I painted my lips fuller, flushed an aureole to its deepest shade, willing him to look at me again with the eyes of a stranger. I lay myself across the stillness of his frame. Even in the dark, I could not deceive. How can we sustain desire when the body counters with reminders of loss? A scar below one knee, stretch marks, sagging flesh. My girl, I was seduced by death the palimpsest beneath my skin, surfacing. That's also kind of dark, yeah. It was supposed to be about desire, so, but those are not extricable from death. That's very Freudian of me, I suppose, but it's ultimately what I believe. So, the last poem in the third book, and then I'm gonna read some new poems, and then I'm gonna end on a Miss Sally poem because I can never end on a note, a note otherwise. Um, this is a longish point, and I hadn't planned to read it, but Julia thought that this would be a good one. And I will tell you a little bit about the epigraph and nothing about the point. You can just hear the point. The epigraph is the study of history with a capital H is the study of empire. And I'm not doing that phrase justice. I heard it in the mouth of a British historian who came to Bucknell in our big lecture series that we have, 
and he's rather well known. His name is Niall Ferguson. Some of you may have seen him because he has huge series on the history of empire um, on PBS. And his arguments, and you will know immediately what I think of his argument, which is that it is shit, is that <laughs> empire is not everywhere always bad. That's his argument, so go check him out. And his further argument is that the study of history is the study of empire. This is my point. History is a room. History is a room I cannot enter. To enter that room, I would need to be a man who makes history, not a girl to whom history happened. Mother to two daughters, I guard their lives with hope. A pinch of salt I throw over my shoulder. To enter that room, I would need to wield a gun. Here, I brandish weapons that serve an art my mother and grandmother knew, how to make of plantain and eggs a meal. To enter that room, I would need to live in the past to understand how power is amassed, eclipsing the sun. Beneath my children's beds, I scatter grains of rice to keep Duppy at bay. To enter that room, I would need to live in the present, this election, this war. Beneath my children's pillows, I place worry dolls to ensure their peaceful sleep. To enter that room, I would need to bridge the distance between my door and what lies beyond. Standing in my foyer at dusk, I ask the sea to fill the crevices of this house with its breath. History is recounted by the dead, returned from their graves to walk in shriveled skins. In our yard, I watch my daughters run with arms, papering the wind. History is recounted by children in nursery rhymes, beauty masking its own violence. In my kitchen, I peel an orange, try to forget my thumb must rest the pulp from its rind. History is recounted in the Book of Explanations. AK-47 begat Uzi, which begat M-16, and all the days of their lives were long. Pausing at the sink, I think of how a pepper might be cut, blade handled, so the knife becomes the fruit slid open, its seeds laid bare. History is recounted in the Book of Beginnings, the story of a people born of forgetting. In our yard, I name the world for my children, praying mantis, robin's egg, maple leaf, words for lives they bring me in their palms. To enter that room, I would need to look into the mirror of language, see in collateral damage the faces of the dead. In our yard, I sow seeds, planting myself in this soil. To enter that room, I would need to uncover the pattern of a life woven onto some master loom. Here, I set the table, sweep the floor, make deals with the god of small things. To enter that room, I would need to be armed with the right questions. Is history the start of evening? Or dawn returning the swallow to the sky? Here, I light candles at nightfall, believe the match waits to be struck. I will also say about that poem that we invaded Iraq the first time when I was 18 years old. All of my adult life in the US has been marked by us being at war. 
and much of the time we do not think about it. As opposed to my childhood in Jamaica, which was never officially a war, and all of the time everybody thought about it. So, <clears throat> in the last several months, years, I lost um, very close family members and a dear friend. Um, and so I have been thinking about my favorite friend again, death, insomnia. The soul is a carpet bag dragged through the dimly lit streets of the body. This night without end, lightning flickers on walls like an old movie projector stuttering. A woman who days before lost speech to a stroke rotates in her bed. A thousand miles away, another puts palm to chest. A bird batters the cage of her ribs. Aphasia, arrhythmia, neither is metaphor. Thunder cracks open this night in which sleep is a prayer not one of us can sound. Exile. The trick is to say morning and a bird will trill on a doorstep. Inside a kitchen, fingers roll Johnny cakes, dropping balls of dough into oil that splatters singeing a wrist. Here, a woman is always singing, each note tethering sound to meaning. The trick is to wait on this doorstep forever. The trick is to remember time is a fish swimming through dark water. The new poems, um, and there's a section of three that I'll just read these three. Um, a lot of them are about this figure of the mad woman. And I don't know why I am interested in madness. I suppose I do know why. My father was literally um, uh, schizophrenic. So, but I'm also interested in it in a gendered sense. And so I've been very interested in the depiction of a lot of women throughout time who are considered crazy and the behavior is regarded as crazy. So the witch, the hag, uh, the hysteric, um, the anorexic, lots and lots of depictions. Um, and I decided I would start writing in the voice of these mad women. I think it's also because the older I get, I'm getting a little bit pissed off. So she gives me some room to speak. And the good girl does not like to talk like this. And I will be very happy to talk about persona because I've come to really think a lot about the range it provides me personally as a poet that might be helpful for some of you who are writers. Ash. Yes, I start fires at will. Was a time I thought to put them out, but blue-tongued flames licked their way into my dreams till I woke ready to strike that first match. You can guess, of course, what comes next, but have you considered the ruined and ruinous require each other for breath? Like the blaze that clears a field or the city, the cigarette turning a city to embers, I deliver damage so that what remains to be sifted from ash can smolder with the knowledge of its own disaster. The Mad Woman's Daughter. All my life I have been pursued by whispers. What make me so greedy consume its own mama? I was born at the time of day between night and morning, the hour of duppies and dream. My mother's screams seemed the world I left and the one I entered, 
Her spirit extinguished the instant my own lit. Before language possessed me, I knew my life would be marked by her sorrow pressed into my skin, by her laughter, broken stones that fill my mouth. Now, when wind gathers at the edges of dawn, I listen for my mother's wail rattling through the cane. I listen to recall no one asks for the meal that leaves us hungry, yet we eat. The mad woman's mother. Because I have all these other mad woman points, so I had to give her a whole family. <laughs> and apparently she, like me, is just interested in women. Only women populate my world. Um, this is not, this is, you know, there are few exceptions to this. My father, my grandfather, my husband. Besides that, that's it. The mad woman's mother <clears throat> is not one junk or shit on her head, is a whole flock. Long time I try and understand how me pickney, who did shine pretty, pretty, brighter than the moon on self, could lose all she shimmer and done. She turned so what less. I saw them say, she mad for us, I saw them say. Look how she mash up every little thing she touch, I saw them say. And I go along. But now I come to think, all the way missing the point. No true, one day the wind will come for each away and knock we down. No true, when we let go, the subtle branch we cling to. Courage or no courage, we're going to have to meet with self at last. And I will end with my very first Miss Sally poem as um, in honor of my grandmother. It is actually the one that has the most things in it that she did say. Okay? After that, it is true that I have taken a lot of poetic license. And the more that I write, the more I'm less sure whether it is my grandmother or me that I'm actually writing about. Um, but this one really was her, and this is what it was like to grow up with this woman. It's called Miss Sally's Wisdom. Chinese man say you put purse on grown, you know, that have no money. When you was not born yet, and your mother was only a little picnic herself, at a clean people house to make ends meet. And when I walk down the street, and some woman stand up on our veranda, chatting whole heap of rubbish, I just go on about my business, same way. I never so much as miss a step when I hear her bellow, Kuyo, but look what that woman come to, no? Now, to see you like so, looking like you lost your last friend, believe me, I understand. I know what it is to want and not have. To dream and next thing you turn round and swoops, your life done pass already before you even think you start. So listen good to your old granny. Clutch your purse on your lap or tight tight up against your chest. But remember, Wanty, wanty, no getty, getty. <laughs> Thank you.